Uh, welcome to uh, today's session. So this is the actually the fourth session, and we're going to do uh, forensic analysis part one. So we're going to look at forensic analysis. Um, so in the last session, you remember the last couple of sessions, we did the VQL fundamentals. So we look at VQL as a query language and uh, looked at the syntax and how it actually works under the covers. But I mean, VQL in itself isn't that interesting without knowing how to implement forensic type or DFIR type use cases with it. That's really what it's for, right? So, um, so now we're going to use that syntax that we've learned from the last uh, part. And we're going to actually uh, learn a little bit and in this module and the next module, we will learn about some of the forensic capabilities that are built into the tool so that we could use Velociraptor uh, with, you know, with the, those capabilities to build more um, advanced detections. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so just a quick overview of the module. Um, we're going to look at some of the very basic forensic analysis and deep inspection capabilities. Um, and I try to structure it so that this module looks at a very basic level at a basic uh, type of analysis techniques and then the next module becomes more specialized analysis technique so in reality though um, most of the time you end up you end up using the basic uh, things like searching for files searching for keywords uh, probably a lot more than the more specialized forensic analysis like you know the uh, the 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 SRAM. Uh, you know the the prefetch, the SRAM, all of those more specialized parsing. Um, I mean, they're good for what they do, but they're very specialized, and so you you know you don't re really use them that much. So, so it it sort of happens that the more um, commonly used forensic techniques is actually are actually the simplest ones. So we will we'll go over them today. So. Um, yeah, the same sort of thing. We can actually, we're, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to work on the notebook, in the notebook, to try and um, <clears throat> to look at, at how these um, capabilities are implemented in VQL uh, so that we could, um, you know, we can write artifacts we've learned that last time and hunt across the network. So let's have a look at the very first uh, example. Uh, just before, Leslie, there is a question before we do that. Uh, can I upload files to the client? Yep, uh, absolutely. We're going to look at that in module seven, I think as well. Yeah, it's module seven, how to upload files to the client. So that's great, great question. Uh, okay, so let's look at the very first forensic, uh, you know, kind of uh, technique that, you know, we would use. And it's probably the most useful one searching for files, uh, so looking for file names. And, um, <clears throat> you know, this is kind of very, very common, you know, uh, you want to know whether a file exists on the endpoint, uh, all the list, all the executables in a certain directory, these kind of things. Um, so in Velociraptor, we have this kind of workhorse for searching for files by name called a glob. And uh, globs are actually a, um, you know, they're supposed to be easy to use. So there's kind of like a wildcard. You have a wildcard and, uh, and you basically kind of search through the file system looking for, you know, uh, star.exe, you know, something like that, right? So um, it's just kind of like a wildcard search. It's a fairly common thing. And I've, I think, you know, you, you know, you have the same thing in the shell um, and, or, you know, in the command shell or PowerShell or whatever, right? Um, the, the, there are some differences though between Velociraptor's globe implementation and the shell. The first one is that the path separators uh, with Velociraptor, you can use either forward slash or backward slash. It, it doesn't really matter on either platform on either platform as well. So on Windows, you can use forward slash or backward slash, and on Linux, you can use the same. It doesn't really matter. Um, Velociraptor supports both. Uh, we have star is the wildcard match. So that's pretty standard. Uh, there's also, you can also do these things called alternatives. Uh, so for example, um, you can say 
you know, star dot uh, exe or DLL or sys. So show me all uh, files with these extensions, DLL, e exe or sys. Uh, this is also a very standard, it's a standard uh, globe expression. Um, but I think it's on bash, it's standard. I, I don't know if it works on Windows like that, but on the Windows command shell, but it is a pretty standard thing. Uh, remember th that the globes are not supposed to be very sophisticated. So you, you can't really do a lot of complicated regular expression type matching with globes. It, they're only very simple. So they're supposed to be very simple. So that's about the extent of how complicated you can make it. Uh, not very uh, in the, the, match, the matching. Uh, but the main difference also with Velociraptor is that we have this concept of star star and uh, star star has to, it has to kind of appear on its own, in its own, you know, path. So it's, it's like slash star star slash like this, right? Um, and what it does is it denotes a recursive search. So it actually uh, says, okay, you know, search the C user recursively all the way down and look for star.exe. So that's what star star does. I don't think the shell has star star. So this is kind of an extension of Velociraptor. Uh, so by default, I think it goes down 30 levels or something. So it goes down pretty much uh, quite a long way. So, um, uh, so it, it goes down a long way, right? So, <clears throat> um, in, uh, in many other uh, other tools like in GRR, this is very expensive operation because it can actually uh, go through and find a lot of files because it, it, if it goes very deep, then it can actually collect a lot of files. Uh, you know, it could be very nested. Uh, and so with GRR, I think they, it's very expensive. So they try and limit it so it doesn't go too deep in um, because you never really know the, the point is that you never really know, you know, there could be one directory deep or could be two or could be 10. And you just don't know how many files you're actually going to hit this way. Uh, with Velociraptor, this isn't really a problem because Velociraptor doesn't, uh, it doesn't measure the, it, 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 it can cancel with time, right? So it has a time limit and it's, it basically says by default, uh, search through 10 minutes. Uh, and then after 10 minutes, it just cancels and immediately aborts, right? So it doesn't really, so if it's very deep, then it will, it will time out in 10 minutes and, and it's fine, right? So it doesn't really need to limit the depth. So we don't really in Velociraptor really limit the depth that much. Um, so here's the documentation page for the Globe plugin. And uh, the interesting thing, um, can we upgrade this time limit? Yes, the time limit, of course, you can change, um, making it longer or shorter, yeah. But I guess the, the point is that um, because other tools like GRR, they, don't, they can't really cancel, so they, they can't really stop. Uh, so if they are about to do an operation and it's unclear how long it's gonna take, like it could potentially be very expensive, like a globe, then there's not really any way to <clears throat> to just go oh no stop you know we've you know we've exceeded a time limit or it's so you know you end up basically with a lot of impact on the endpoint so they try and limit the depth so you know try and take a guess but it's it's difficult to know but you have to kind of know how I mean you don't know what files are there right uh, is there a characters limit for the search for star star. So there's there's a limit in the file system, right? Like you can't have a path that's longer than I think on Windows 32 Ks, but I don't think there's a limit in Velociraptor um, on on the path on the on the path. Okay, cool. So uh, this is the globe expression uh, man, man page. So it, yeah, it tells you like you can use a, uh, a number here to limit the depth as well if you wanted to. Uh, there's a couple of notes here that I just wanted to point out with globs. Uh, the first thing is that in Velociraptor, uh, and this is hap this happens in the registry. We're going to see that you can globe through the registry as well, but there, we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, you can actually sometimes have like slashes in the file name, uh, and so that makes it difficult because you don't know whether you know the slash means you know a path separator or or not. You know, so Velociraptor uses this scheme where it will uh if if the 
path, it basically treats a path as a sequence of <clears throat> components. And then each component, if it has slashes in it, it gets little quotes around it. So, so this means that this is one big component, right? Even though it has slashes in the middle, uh, that part is just like one path component, right? So in, um, in Windows, you can actually make uh, directories with a, a forward slash. Um, I don't know if you can make directories with a forward slash, but you can make registry keys with forward slashes in them. So like that. And so when you're globbing through the registry, this becomes more important. So uh, let's let's have a look at an example. I mean, these are the slides that are kind of boring. We'll just jump into the um, you know the practical. So as uh, we're going to do that every day, uh, we're just going to run the Velociraptor with the GUI command, right? So Velociraptor GUI, and um, it's going to bring up the you know the same thing. We're, we're going to open up a net notebook. Um, you know, let's create a new one. So this is going to be uh, forensic analysis. Right. Submit. <clears throat> and I usually like to kind of open it up a little bit. Cool. So if we create a new cell, so let's have a look at an example. Select star from, it's going to be globe. Right now, if I press question mark, then it will show me all the completions, possible completions, globes. So here I'm going to put C users star star slash star dot exe, for example, like that's the example. So I've got forward slash here, um, but if, and uh, let me just uh, run that for you. Okay, actually uh, I should have limited it because could take a little while because I don't know how deep it is. Yeah. Um, so it, it works, right? Uh, if so, this is a, you can use forward slashes, um, or if you're using backward slashes, like in Windows, because this is a string, right? Then you need to escape them like this, right? So you have to go double them up, right? Uh, let me just show you that. So limit five. Because other, otherwise, it's an escape uh, character, right? So this is this is like a, a string thing, and it's very inconvenient because in Windows we happen to have a lot of backslashes, right? In a lot of things, so so it's kind of inconvenient. So, but so there is a way in Velociraptor to uh, denote a row string. So it's sort of like if you've ever used Python, there is a, a row string in Python. Uh, which doesn't use backslashes to escape anything. And in that case, uh, this is the row string in Velociraptor. It's three single quotes in a, in a row. And when you do that, then it's just a little bit easier. Uh, three single quotes, one, two, three, is a row string. And so it doesn't, then you don't have to escape, uh, double escape the, um, the backslashes. Um, okay, we have one question. Uh, what about uh, symlinked hard link directories? Does VR avoid loops on those? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, so on Windows, I think we don't follow links at all because uh, this is actually a very difficult problem to solve uh, symlink loops. Um, on Linux, I think there is code there that detects symlinks, but um, it isn't that reliable. It's not that good. So sometimes there are problems. I think there is actually a bug on the issues uh, page right now about this on Linux. Um, yeah, so probably this uh, this will become an option, I guess, in the next uh, version. When we fix that bug, we'll probably have an option of whether you want to follow same links or not. Uh, there isn't really a good... Uh, decision about it because sometimes you do and sometimes you don't uh, and then some sim links can cause loops it does have loop detection so we don't uh, we don't follow the loops but sometimes there are some very complicated sim links that, that do the unexpected things um, yeah it is a problem so for example like if you do a, glo a recursive globe in slash proc on linux then uh, this is the current bug right 
then what happens is in slash proc in in slash proc there is actually a link to slash to the top level directory so suddenly even though even even if you avoid the loop as in going back into proc you know, uh, but you still end up searching the entire file system, right? Because there is a link that goes to slash. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> that's not quite what is expected, right? So there is, there is actually, yeah, it's not an easy solution, but uh, it's a good question. Excellent question. Uh, in, some, in some extent, you, you know, maybe we can control it by looking at the depth or something like that. But on Windows, it's it's usually pretty good. Uh, you just kind of search recursively. And I think on Windows, we don't follow the sim links um, because there aren't really that many sim links and it's not that useful. Um, but there are some, but not, not as many as on Linux. Okay, so this is just a, a quick word. Um, is it possible to search for ADS? Excellent question. Yes, yes, it is. We're gonna get to that in just a couple of slides. So. Yes. Um, all right. So we'll go back to the slides. Let me just close that. All right. So, so this is uh, basically how you do the globe, right? Now, uh, when when uh, Velociraptor figures out the the algorithm that it uses to uh, to globe through the file system, uh, uses a common prefix algorithm. So basically, if you uh, if you have a lot of globes to 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 do, uh, then it's much better to give the list of block uh, of globes uh, together at once, because uh, Velociraptor will then figure out, like if you have these two, then it will figure out that it actually needs to walk over each directory and just automatically compare for these two names. So it walks over the files one time instead of uh, if you did these globe like two separate globes. Is much more expensive than one globe with two globe with two expressions in it, right? Uh, because it can optimize that out. So if you have multiple ones, you should use them like this. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, you can always use in this particular example. You you can use the um, you know the um, uh, the alternate syntax. You can use uh, curly braces. Uh, dot curly braces exe comma dll like we, we mentioned that in the last the last slide yes but i'm just saying this is an example i mean it's not always that obvious right but like you might have a star star here and then you might have a subdirectory here that's already covered by the star star anyway right uh but then it, it's still the same thing it will still go through and do one pass over that directory instead of doing it twice right so it, it is still uh, more, more efficient to it's always more efficient to use one globe with multiple expressions. Um, another question is start from using starter exe in the globe, is there a flag to determine whether a file is a PE? So, so, so this is a very good question. Uh, globe just looks for file names. If you want to do other things, I mean, you're still doing a query, right? So, so you can do that with the query, right? You're going to get the list of files that match star.exe. And if you want to determine whether the file is really a PE or just has a .exe extension, uh, then you can parse the PE, you can parse it and then figure out whether it is. So you can still, so the idea is that it's just a very basic building block. And then you can use that in your query to do other things, right? So, so um, this is kind of the approach in VQL. Cool, but that, these are all very excellent questions. Um, let me just go back to the example here and let me just go and look at the raw data as i mentioned last uh last time the binoculars show you the raw data because i wanted to show you a little bit about how uh what actually what data is actually coming back from this globe plugin so you can see remember that we we talked about uh the result from velociraptor is a row list of rows and each row is those curly braces, that's a row, right? So we have a name, there's a name column, there's a mod time column, there's a full path column, which is just a full path, you know, relative to the C drive or whatever. Uh, and then we have these timestamps, the M time, which is actually the same as the mod time, so the same thing, uh, B time, C time, and A time. So B time is the birth timestamp. Um, and, um, and C time and A time, and it, it, 
it depends on the APIs. There actually might not even make any sense uh, whether, you know, in, in this case, the M time is before the B time. We will see why that is actually, uh, because it is possible to change the timestamp. So usually like when, you know, when something is, you know, time stomped or moved back or un unzipped usually, then it goes back. Um, can you use Globe in the registry? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, we'll, we'll see that in just a second. Uh, but basically, uh, and then we have the size and the dear, and the, is it a directory? So we need to know if it's a directory or not, or is it a link? So we, we can tell if it's a, a link or not. So, uh, so, that, um, so that's the sort of information that we get from, uh, from the globe. So the globe is really just used to search for file names in, in uh, the directories. So uh, excellent. Someone just asked, uh, can we use globe in the registry? And so this is exactly the next slide. Um, how deep can star star go? Is it based on OS res uh, restriction or can it go as deep as possible? Um, so star star go, uh, star star goes by default 30. You can increase it uh, if you want. You just do a star star and a number. Um, and, you know, and then you can go as, as, uh, as deep as you can. There's no actual limit in, in Velociraptor. Uh, so it looks like, yeah, in Windows, the maximum limit is 128. You say, okay, that's, <laughs> so, so yeah, there's no limit in Velociraptor. The default, if it's just star star, then it's 30, right? Um, Timestamps are from standard info entry, not from file name entry with NTFS. This is, these are excellent questions. So yes, so the, uh, what you're seeing here depends on the accessor. So let me just let me just hold your uh, question for one minute and let me explain the accessors. Uh, these are really great questions uh, because it looks like you guys are already thinking ahead. So this is this is awesome, right? So um, we've seen that Globe is really useful because it's great for searching for files, right? It's, you can you can write a Globe expression. But then when you realize that there's actually a lot of different things that you would be cool to be able to search in that way. So files are the obvious thing, but you know, maybe we want a globe in the registry, you know, or maybe we want a globe uh, inside uh, uh, like uh, the NTFS. Um, so we can use the NTFS parser to parse the NTFS uh, in, in a low level. And then maybe we want to use a globe to actually hook into that parser so that we can search inside the past NTFS, uh, you know, kind of virtual file system, right? And, um, and so these are an ex examples of basically this. So we, we basically want to do the same thing, but just in different contexts. So this is the great idea of these called file system accesses. So accessors is like you think of it as a driver. It's just a piece of code that provides an ability to access a specific type of thing that looks like a file system, right? So it makes it look like a file system. It's, it's like a driver that makes it look like a file system. And so there's a, a whole bunch of different ones. This, these are only some of them, but there's, there's a bunch of different ones. And using accesses, it allows us to take any plugin that expects to work on files and apply it in lots of different contexts. So for instance, um, and it's just a general, it's a general concept in Velociraptor, right? So the globe is one example. You know, in here, if we have a globe, for example, so, you know, if I say, let globe uh, slash star, right? If I don't specify an accessor, then it's gonna tell me the top level of uh, uh, of the file, so the, of the file accessor, right? It's going to use the file access, and the file accessor at the top level is the C drive. The drive is the drive names, right? Because Velociraptor paths really all, always start with a slash, the, the top level. So then we can say, you know, slash C column slash, right? So that's the C drive, you know, and so on, the recycle bin and all that sort of stuff, right? So, uh, but uh, what we can do is we can also specify an accessor. So that's the, when we specify an accessor, uh, registry or, or, or reg, if you want to type less, that's the same thing. Uh, and then we can see when we run that, 
then the top level uh, of the registry accessor is like HKEY classes root, HKEY, it's the top level, is the hives, right? That's the top level. So now we can do things like slash, uh, you know, HKEY user, um, this, uh, actually, the, the, it'd be limited to five, but there's, there's a few more hives. I think HKEY users is another one. So that shows us all the users, right, with their seeds and, and so on, right? So it's like, um, so it looks, it makes the registry look like a file system, right? So it, you can glob into registry that way, right? Um, similarly, uh, you can also use the NTFS accessor. With NTFS, it's just a different accessor. So it's like a different uh, driver, I guess, kind of. And uh, it presents uh, a view that looks like a file system. And it uses the parser, the NTFS, the built-in NTFS parser to do that. So in this lab, the top level is going to be the C drive, right? And, yep. and if we do that, the next level is, uh, is going to be the, the top level of the NTFS, right? So you've got the attribute, the back cluster, the MFT, and, and so on. I mean, we limited it to five. We can increase that a bit maybe 50 say so uh you know the log file the mft the mirrors so it looks like it looks like a file system right um but it uses the ntfs now have a look at the at the full path and you can see that the full path uh that the ntfs driver gives us actually looks like backslash backslash dot slash c drive so that the top level is actually a device name uh, and that's because the NTFS driver parses the device, the raw device, for the C drive, uh, and then and then it builds the file system on on top of that, the file system view on top of that. So the full path internally is always starts with the device name. It's and that becomes important later on when we look at VSS. So we're going to look at that. Um, Another quick question, uh, how are direct read possibilities of Velociraptor com compared to CAPE? When using Velociraptor to pull triage artifacts using CAPE targets, can we access as much as we can using CAPE with direct read for log files? So I'm not sure what you mean by direct read for log files, but uh, the, way this, uh, the way it works is that when a file is locked in Veloc, so normally you can use the file accessor, to access files and it uses OS APIs like file open and, and stuff like this. But um, uh, by, def uh, by default, the file accessor, if the file is locked, so it can't read the file, then it falls back to NTFS parser. So then at that point, it just automatically falls into a raw NTFS parser and it accesses the file through the NTFS parser transparently. So you won't even see that uh, it was it, so it still grabs the the data from the the, the disk, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So you won't actually even see that. So usually, the the recommendation is that usually use file for pretty much everything because uh, because it means that it's uh, file is faster because you don't really have to parse the NTFS for most files because most files aren't locked. But then when you hit a locked file, it will just automatically use NTFS and you won't see that, it will just work. Um, so, but if you, if you want to use, if you want to get something that you can't get with the file APIs at all, like uh, ADS, uh, or um, or like the, the the special NTFS files like dollar MFT or dollar log file things like that. Then you will have to just you can just use NTFS pause accessor directly. Uh, you can just specify NTFS accessor. <clears throat> so um, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, the registry accessor is the example. Um, it just uses uh, the OS API. So the registry accessor uses OS APIs like registry open um, to, um, to just read keys and values. And it tries, uh, what the accessors all try and do is make it look like a file system, right? So whatever they're doing may not actually be a file system at all. For example, we have a process accessor now, so we can read process memory like a file, right? But it's not really a file, right? It just makes it look like a file. Um, 
you know, in the process accessor, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to glob for processes, but you can certainly do something like Yara scan a process, right? Uh, and that, and then, and that works, right? So you don't need to. So that's what the accessors do, right? They make it look like an, uh, like a file system, but it doesn't have to be. So uh, in here, we use the OS API to make it look like a file system. So that means that we have an analog. An analog. It's like a uh, of keys, the keys are like directories, right? So they they make it look like a directory, and the values in the registry make it look like a file. So we can read the va the values, you know, and then the key uh, sort of looks like a directory, so we can you know glob it and stuff like that, right? Uh, so default values in the registry, like uh, in a registry, keys can also have values in them. So there's no difference in the name. Uh, but uh, we have to make a difference, so we call it at. Uh, so it's it's a pretty common convention to do that. Um, but usually, with the registry access, uh, uh, with registry, the value content is included in the data attribute because usually values are very small anyway, and we can get them. Uh, so in that case, what we do is we put it in the data attribute. Uh, so let's go back to the registry again. Uh, so you'll see that uh, every registry, I'll just do rage because it's just a little bit less to type. When you when you run, uh, so you can put two queries and it just makes two tables, right? So it doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, so the top table here, uh, we're using the first. We're looking at the first five accesses, uh, five, five keys, um, and then uh, uh, you can see that there, that um, <clears throat> there is a data column doesn't have anything in it. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, I don't know, we'll try and go in a, a little bit deeper. Oh, based. <laughs> um, try and find some values there. I don't know, maybe environment have values in there. And you can use forward slash or backward slash, the same sort of deal, right? Um, yeah, so you can see there's some values in here, right? So you, you can see that because we are already reading the values, you know, from the registry, we may as well make them accessible somehow. So the, 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 the value content is actually passed in this. So this data column is like a, um, a free form di dictionary of key value pairs that the accessor just tells us about this file, right? Um, so all the other columns of the globe plugin are standard and the data column depends on the accessor to what kind of information it gives you, right? So uh, it, it basically says, oh, you know, this is a type SZ and this is the value. So you don't necessarily have to, uh, to open and read it. It just makes it a little bit easier for when you're globing in the registry. Um, yeah, there's a there's a question here. Okay, cool. Uh, if to, uh, the question is, while we're talking about quoting strings, could you mention quoting column names that contain spaces? Now, this is an excellent question uh, that we probably should have covered in uh, you know in the VQL uh, um, part. But sometimes uh, you can get uh, uh, column names that contain special characters like spaces. Or dots or something like that, and in that case, uh, you might want to quote them. So, for example, here we have full path. You can actually in it's the same in SQL. You use backticks like this, and uh, and and then anything inside the backtick is the column name, right? So if you have end up with a column name with a dot in it or space, then uh, uh, let me show, let's, let me just show you how you would end up with something like that. You basically for example, uh, if you did something like, let's say you wanted to get the value here. So you'll go data.value. So you'll go select data.value, right? So that gives me the value, right? So this is the content of the key. Now, if I somehow let x equals, and then I wanted to select from it, select, and I wanted to get this column, right? 
So how can I do that? If, if I just do this, this is not going to work from X, right? This is not going to work because it, it thinks that what I want to do is I want to get a value called a, a column called data and I want to access and it's, you know, access the value in it, right? So it has no idea what it, you're talking about. And in fact, it will tell me that it doesn't know what the data is, right? So it doesn't really, it doesn't really work like that because it, it thinks, if I just write it like this, it thinks that what I want is a column called data and then I want to do a dot and then get value out of it. But I'm trying to tell it, no, no, the dot is really part of the name of this column, right? Because we selected it like this, right? So this is what you do. If you do that, then it's saying that column is the whole thing is just a name. So, so that would work, right? So it's, it's still inconvenient. So try not to get yourself into this situation. So, you know, usually if you are in here, you can go as value like this, right? So that makes it a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, but it, sometimes you end up with these kind of situations. And so, uh, especially if you're reading like a CSV file or whatever, so it might be a space. Yeah space in the column name, the same thing, right? So sometimes you'll get a column name, like you're parsing a CSV file or something and you'll have a space in it. Um, now, another question, does the registry access their work against the registry high file or can it access in-memory hives like shim cache not yet written to disk? Very excellent questions. So many, so many good questions. So the registry accessor uh, is just using the API, just the read-write API. Uh, there is another one called a raw registry accessor, which parses the raw registry hives. Um, and the last part of your question is whether we can read uh, the, the shim cache hive, which is not written to disk, which is in memory. Uh, currently, no. So currently, we cannot extract it out of the memory. Uh, does the registry accessor use the transactional log files? So the raw registry accessor. Um, it, it, which parses the registry files does not. Um, the, the actual registry, uh, registry file, uh, this one, it uses the API. So it would use their log files because it uses the API, right? Cool. These are all very good questions. Cool. Okay, let's, um, let's go back to the slides. So this is the registry accessor. That's kind of all we want to say about that. We pointed out you know, that we can get the value. So that's great. And uh, now it's time to do an, ex an, an exercise, run, run once artifact. Okay, so this is, this is a very simple uh, example, but uh, let's just work through an exercise of uh, trying to find out whether we have run, run once uh, keys. So let's go to the next slide and see what are those run, run once keys? Well, what are we talking about? So it turns out that um, you know, there are certain keys in the registry that make Windows run software on, you know, startup or, or boots or whatever, right? So there's different different kinds of situations, um, and and this is where they are. There's a whole bunch of them. This is this is not an exhaustive list, right? But it's for the, this exercise, we're gonna we're gonna look at this, and um, and and malware loves to put keys in there, right? So malware will put a key in there, so when the user logs in, then it will run. So what we want to do in this exercise is we want to basically try and find uh, if there's anything in that um, in, in, in that hive. Now I don't actually know if this VM has anything in that hive, but I guess we'll find out. So um, so let's let's copy it. So let's start from here. Sorry, we'll start fresh, and let's look at star. Yep. So it's going to be uh, HKey current user, uh, software Microsoft Windows current version run. Okay, great. So software uh, what was it again? <laughs> uh, software Microsoft Windows, great. You know what? <laughs> it's too much to to worry about. We'll just do the star stuff. <laughs> right. Okay, so this is going to give us uh, all the run keys. I don't even know where they are, but whatever. Uh, and okay, cool. So what we're going to do is a recursively search for it. So let's do that. It's not the not the most uh, efficient search, but you know why not? 
Um, so it's going to take a long time because I said, you know, recursively search through all the, the hive. Oh, look, so we've got some, so that's cool. Uh, in the last course, I did it on a, on a cloud VM, which was super clean. So there was actually nothing there. So that was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's being lazy. So we found that there are some, some uh, stuff in there, right? So some of them are like, there's a OneDrive and then there is a binary thing here. Um, you know, a startup approved. Okay, that's something else. But uh, but uh, this this is the one that uh, okay that, that we want to get to, right? So that's cool. So we found a run key. So uh, what we want to actually do now is we want to actually uh, convert that into some kind of a artifact, so we can you can actually hunt for it. So we want to kind of I guess productionize this. And what we want to, so we can find, find the key, all right, right, that's fine. But what we actually want to do now is we want to take a step back and think, how would I like to run this across the network to make it useful and actionable, right? So this is all about kind of trying to make the data useful. Um, you know, so it's not just enough about just getting the key. What you want to do is format it in a useful way. And what I'd really like to do now is, uh, is I'd like to run this across the network and then I want to get the information about first of all, what is the uh, the name of the startup program, you know, here, and you know, for example, like OneDrive, yeah, that's kind of legitimate. Okay, fine. Then you know, what would what would be also cool is to see when it was actually put in, right? So that's the M time here, uh, but that that M time is not for the value, it's actually coming from the key. Uh, values don't have end time, only, only keys. But so, but anyway, if I'll, 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 I'd like to get that information. So it gives me a little bit more context of when, when it was possibly um, added. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I actually want to get the, the time, the value, right? So most of these columns here, not super useful. Uh, the name is useful, the, the time, and, you know, and then maybe the value. So <clears throat> so I'm going to do the name. Uh, okay, more time, so which is the same thing here. <clears throat> and it's going to be data dot value. And again, I usually I usually um, start up start up path. right? Um, so this this actually interprets what does that mean, right? So now when I do this, then it basically will tell me. Um, <clears throat> And then maybe tighten up this. So you see this, that, that was that binary thing that we, you know, pro it's probably a different, let's just also add the full path as well. Because that gives me the path to the, to the registry. So that's, this is just the extra little step of making, um, of making the, the thing more productionized. So, you know, then I can say, oh, you know, here's the, the proper place for it. So maybe copy and paste that instead of that star star. So it's a little bit more accurate. It will also be faster. And uh, I mean, either. Yeah. So now it's going to be super fast because it's just going to get it from the right place. And that will also eliminate that other false positive. So that's cool. So, so, that's, so that becomes more productionized. But there was a couple of other there was a couple of other um, locations in here, right? So there was HK local machine run, HK current user run, um, and then there was the run run once keys. So we can convert those. Uh, you know, maybe have a couple of them, a couple of globs here, right? Um, you know, turn it into a list. Yeah, copy. This is what we've looked at before. Paste. Yeah. So that's kind of what we looked at before, right? So so now we can go and say, you know, okay, HP current user, uh, local machine, right? So it's gonna be a. Software, Microsoft, Windows, current version, run. Yeah. And then the same thing, but run, run, months, run. So, yeah. 
So if I want to go to is run. Yeah, so it, it gives us a few more a few more hits, right? Use a star before software. Uh, yeah, I guess you you could do that. Um, yeah, to to look at all the hives because it's probably it's this yeah it's probably going to be relatively cheap. So you, you can do that. Yeah, use a star before hive, but maybe it's going to be expensive. I don't know. It's going to look through it in every hive. Maybe it's going to make more hits. I don't know. Yeah, so that's that's a possibility. But you see, now we've we've basically got a detection uh, here, according to the. Um, uh, okay, so that's cool. But let's let's take it up once. Uh, why three single quotes? Okay, that's a great question. So um, we don't really need it in this case. But three single quotes are. Um, uh, are a known a, a raw string, right? So that means that we can use single backslashes. We don't have to escape them because that's why we have the three single quotes. It's just that type of string that doesn't have. Um, so you can put, put backslashes. Um, we didn't really need to in, in this case because I used forward slashes. But but you can use backwards uh, backslashes as well right here. Uh, yeah. So actually, that's that's true. We we we've got. We've got the backslashes here. So that's why we have the three single quotes. We don't need it uh, in here, in this case. But, uh, but let's have a look at this example here. So, so here we have uh, the program, right? Uh, let's, uh, let's take it up one more step and say, well, no, actually, I've got the value of it, which is great, right? So this is, this is the, you know, a lot of tools will give you that, just reading a registry key and telling you the value. That's what you know. That's what a lot of tools do, but that's not how we use Velociraptor, right? What, what, let's let's take it one more step and figure out um, and figure out how, uh, like, let's say the hash of these of these things. How do we actually go and say, well, you know, is first of all, is the file still there? You know, is uh, and then what is the hash? Is it a good file or a bad file? We have no idea, right? And so you can see that we have a, a whole bunch of examples here of uh, run, run once um, type keys. And what I'd like to do also is ha have a hash here, right? But if I just went ahead and just said, okay, well, why don't we hash this startup bus? So let's let's uh, do it. let x equals. Uh, you know, we, we don't really need that limit there, and then. Um, what I want to do is uh, hash uh, hash takes a path startup path startup start. All right um, from X. So what it's going to do is it's going to try and hash this this string right this startup path. Uh, this is the val the value the content of the value. And if the value starts, if it looks like that, so that's fine, right? That's the, that's that's a file, and that's great. But it's not actually a file, right? It's a it's a command line. So this is the whole command line. And if the command line doesn't, take, I mean, this doesn't take any arguments. So it it works in this case. We we go and we pick up the hash, and that's great, right? But in these cases, you see, it doesn't really work because what is happening is it it's trying to find. Uh, use the entire thing as a hash, right? And that's not, so what we need to do is say, well, actually this is not a file name, right? This is a command line. And this first part is the actual file name, right? So what we want to do is maybe just figure out how to extract that file name in the query. So then the query can, can work with it, right? So, um, so uh, we we'll notice that there are a couple of, different cases that we need to handle here but let's let's handle them one at a time so this first one uh we can immediately find a rule to say well okay i know what the file name looks like the command that's going to run it starts with a quote and then there is something a whole bunch of stuff and then there's another quote right so so let's try and and uh and extract that part so what we really want to do here is um we want to 
um, pass, oops, pass the string with a regex, right? So it's got a string, right? The, the data value is a string. And we're going to use a regular expression to just try and pass the, um, the value out, right? So let's see what, this, what parameters it takes. So first of all, it takes the string and then the regex. So let's give it the string data dot value, right? And then the regex, let's figure out a regex that will extract, uh, extract it. So uh, let's use single quotes because we're going to look at the rule. So it's going to be a, um, it's going to be at the start of the line, there'll be a quote and then a whole bunch of characters that are not quotes, uh, one or more, and then a quote, right? So that's what we're going to extract. That's my regular expression. And so, uh, and then I'm going to capture these, uh, these things that are inside the quotes. That's going to be my capture variable. So in a regular expression, you have a capture variable and that's what's going to be extracted uh, from in, in this pause, uh, pause with, with string. So let's, uh, let's, let's try that out. So, uh, so you can see that pause string with regex. So this function, it's a VQL function, right? So it's going to be evaluated. It's going to apply the regex on top of the, um, on the, uh, the string. So when the string has a quote, uh, then it has a capture expression, which is G1. It's, this is G means like a capture group, right? So you have capture group G1, G2, G3, G4, uh, the more parentheses you put, right? So, so this is great. This, this works great, right? So this one, super. Um, and in fact, uh, that's, that's what we're going to be hashing, right? So that looks great, but, um, but it doesn't work here because this one doesn't have a quote, right? But you can then say, well, okay, if it doesn't have a quote, then it looks like it starts at the beginning. So let's go back and find, so you can actually put multiple regular expressions here. So that's the first one we're going to try and match. Right? But this, uh, this expression here, it doesn't have a quarter at the beginning, but so in, if it doesn't have a quarter at the beginning, then it's gonna go, all, uh, we're gonna start at the beginning, right? Start at the start of the line and then, uh, and then until the space, right? So we're looking for a whole bunch of characters that are not space, right? And then a space. And then we actually wanna grab the first example here, right? So. So that's going to be our second regular expression. Okay, so let's run that. So that's cool. Uh, oh, wait a sec. Oops. So, but um, and also not quotes. Oops. Uh, because if it had quotes, then it means that you know it would be the first the first example, right? So. Uh, in this example, it's not space and not quotes. That's a bit better. Okay, cool. So, so this one worked because of the first example. This one worked as well. That looks pretty good. Uh, this one uh, doesn't work. So let's add something there. Okay. We can put a potential space there that should get uh, this example, right? So that's good. That one works, that one works. That one doesn't quite work because it has, well, it, it works in terms of extracting it. So, so that's good. So that, that's the next step. So let's, uh, so let's say as, um, you know, binary or parse. Let's just go parse. So you see what we're doing is, so that just changes the name of the column to parse dot g1 so dot g1 is going to be the past one so what we want to do is hash when we're hashing instead of hashing the startup path we're going to hash pass dot g1 okay because that's going to be the the binary so this almost works except for this guy that doesn't quite work because it has a percent uh, expansion here 
So the percent expansion is, it means that there's an environment variable that has to be expanded into it. So we have to take care of that, right? So we'll use expand, expand the path using the environment. Cool, question mark, it takes a path, okay? So we'll expand it using the environment variable and that should give us the full path name, right? So all the hashes work, right? So what we're doing is we are massaging the uh, the name into into that, right? So so uh, then we we don't need that. That's an intermediate one. We don't need it. So we can just simply um, specify the columns that we do need. So we want to get the hat. Uh, we want to get the um, yeah. Data path and then hash as hash. Okay, and then that should clean up the columns, right? So we, we don't care about the past ones, more in the intermediate one. So, right, so here's our, so this is our example here, right? So, so that's kind of, um, that's a pretty cool example of when we run this query, not only do we get the keys, but we will actually can use that and go and grab the files from the disk or the hashes from the disk. So that is really important for enrichment. Uh, if you've ever done this kind of hunt, um, uh, like, you know, a lot of the time you think, oh, you know, I'm gonna do this hunt. I'm gonna grab the, the registry key from the uh, run run once, and then I'm gonna do stacking and I'll figure out whether, um, you know, you know, uh, everybody's got uh, you know OneDrive. That's probably fine. But then, if there's some some weird ones that you know only one machine in my entire network has, then um, you know, then maybe I'll look into it. It's more suspicious. Well, that sounds like a good hunt. But if you've ever done something like that, you'd realize it doesn't work because uh, it, the number of really unique run 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 keys that you have in any real environment is stunning right it's absolutely staggering most of the most of uh like you know that it's just such a long tail right you'll have you'll have a whole bunch of very common uh run run one run once keys that are used um you know like OneDrive is probably going to be on every machine right but then you just have this massive amount of of tail of uh binaries of keys that are in the system that you know are just very different and it's just you just it's not feasible to go and check each of them individually so what you really want is a way of automatically enriching that with and giving you uh, a way to triage those things uh, on you know immediately right so for example if you then uh, grab the hash you can figure out whether the file is even there still you know, a lot of the time the run keys are, are left over, the thing's been uninstalled or whatever, and the run key is still there. So it's not really relevant anymore. Uh, and then you can also get the hashes in Faristotl or something like that. And you can get a really quick idea of whether it's malware or not. Because just there's just a lot of a lot of junk. So this kind of thing really helps a lot. Okay, cool. So so that was just an example of this VQL with the run run once keys. Um, there's a row registry puzzle. I'm, I think we might just go through it a little bit quicker because we're only on slice 13 now. Oh um, <clears throat> so you can actually have uh, the row registry uh, parser. I'm just going to go through it really fast. It's the same thing as the NTFS puzzle, but it's essentially um, a, row, a row registry parser. Uh, it's it um, it's needed for especially because uh, so it, it looks at this end user. If you want to ever look at the end user dat file, um, it's locked, so it automatically uses the NTFS posit to to get it right. So um, so you don't need to worry about it too much, but it does that on um, behind the scenes. So it it uses the NTFS posit to get the raw data and then the raw registry data posit to to access the keys and values. Um, the only trick about it is that the name of the, the path that you of the globe that you're searching is built up out of a URL. Um, and 
uh, th that's because the the um, accessor itself needs to know how to open the actual file to parse. So it has to be you know built on the URL. And the way it works is there is a scheme and there's a path. The scheme is like how what accessor the the, the underlying you know um, accessor should use. And then there's a path and, and so on. But it ends up basically looking like this. So uh, if you give this to the raw registry accessor, then this means to it, uh, I'm going to use the file accessor to open this and to use the .dat. And then there's a hash, which means the, you know it's a fragment part of the URL. And, and then I'm going to look at this thing. Um, it just, I mean, it is a little bit confusing, but um, I'd say that's probably a more advanced use of that. So we'll, we'll just skip, skip that. Uh, the URL notation is a little bit confusing, but from here, uh, I guess all you, you can take is take from here is that you should use the URL function to build them. Uh, yeah, we'll skip that. The data accessor. Okay. So that is, um, the data accessor is used to try and hide, um, it, 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 as I mentioned before, accesses make something, something look like, a, um, a, a, you know, like a file system, right? With, but the thing that it looks like a file system may not actually be a file system. It may, uh, may be something else, right? So uh, uh, here's an example of that. The data accessor is, is the perfect example of it. Let me just go up, okay, create a new cell. Um, so there's a whole bunch of, uh, of um, files and fi uh, glo uh, sorry, go back. Whole bunch of VQL functions or plugins that use uh, expect files. An example to that is the hash uh, function. And if you push question mark, then it expects a path to open and an access to open it with. So if I had a file on disk, then you know it will go and open it and hash it, right? We've seen that before in the last example. But sometimes you want to hash a string like hello world, right? I want to hash that string. <clears throat> and if so if I just did this, then it would on, open a file called hello world and try and hash it, right? This is not what we want. What we want is to hash the string. So this is where the data accessor comes in. The data accessor uh, makes it makes the file name uh, equal to a file. Like it, uh, it creates an in-memory file that looks that the content of it is that string. So when the uh, plugin or function or VQL function tries to open that file with this accessor, then it gets an in-memory file, then it operates on it. So it's just, it's just a way uh, for us. Uh, so we're just going to do scope, right? It's just a way for us to uh, leverage uh, all of the plugins and functions that use files and then use them in lots of different contexts. I mean, otherwise, think about what we would have to do. We would have to create a function uh, that opens you know, a file like hash, and then we have to create another function that just, just hashes a string because sometimes we need to hash a string, right? And it would be very confusing because we'll have lots of versions of the same thing, one operating on the string, one operating on files. So the accessor uh, makes it, unnecessary, we can always operate on a string. And you can always do things like Yara scan a string or parse a string or whatever, right? Just using this um, sort of like data accessor. So, so I'm just gonna mention that here, uh, just the example that we said. And uh, we, we really of, we often use it to parse uh, like things like CSV files uh, that are in memory. Uh, it turns out that it's actually useful. This is how the CSV type uh, of parameter is implemented. Uh, we can pass these um, the strings as a CSV, and uh, and it's a good way of basically introducing tabular data into your artifact as a parameter. So we'll just um, yeah we'll just quickly uh, skip that, but we'll we'll see it a bit later on anyway. Because I, I really wanted to get to the next part. I didn't want to run out of time. Uh, okay, so that was globbing, right? So globbing is uh, very cool. And then the next, and so globbing is probably the most common uh, 
you know, DFIR tool technique that we use. Uh, the next most common one is searching data. Um, and, you know, we, we basically forensics is, has always been about searching for keywords or searching for patterns of text or something like that. So, you know, searching for credit card data, for search for URLs, binaries, registry patterns, whatever. So probably it goes without saying that the most, whenever we say search for something, we probably mean Yara, right? Because Yara is the most common tool for, and it's actually a really, really good tool for searching for, it's like a super powerful grep, right? Searching for patterns. Uh, so Yara is, um, if you guys aren't familiar with it, um, it's, it's really optimized to scan for lots and lots of rules, so lots of keywords um, at the same time. So it's really fast. Uh, and we use it in Velociraptor. Uh, we just use the library, the Yara library. So we, we just kind of like, um, you know, use, use the library. We use the two uh, things in the library, just Yara plugin, just uh, scans a file. And then we use proc Yara that scans the process memory. So this used to be the only way to scan process memory, but now there is a process accessor. So you can just use the same plugin for both. So let's have a look uh, at what a Yara rule looks like. Uh, it's, it's got this kind of structure. It's a little bit verbose for sort of simple rules. So I mean, even a simple rule um, is kind of, you know, a little complicated to write but it's, it's designed to actually scan for lots and lots of strings. The way it works is you have a keyword rule, then the name of the rule, then you have this um, brace, then you have a strings section. And this is where you put all your strings. You give them names if you want. Um, dollar A equals, you can have, uh, this is a regular string, and then you can have a modifier here uh, no case, wide, or even a reg ex, regular expression. So you put all of these in, and then you have the condition. And the condition says, you know, what's it going to match? Uh, when when is a match occur? The match occurs when uh, A is matching and B or C or whatever, right? So you can you can play around with that, or you can just usually go any of them or all all of them, right, or whatever. Um, Okay, so I've got an ex example here. Um, it's kind of a little bit more complicated, but I like this example because it, it gives us uh, a, a feel as to why how we can use uh, Yara in a kind of novel and cool way. And that's really the power of VQL is to, to use things in a novel way. So let's just imagine that um, in this case, uh, that there is a new browser uh, on the market. Let's say Edge, right? But we have no idea um, what you know, uh, where it stores its browser, uh, where it stores its directories, uh, its um, you know, uh, files. We don't know, and we actually don't even know uh, what is the structure of the cache or the history files. Let's let's assume that, right? Um, so in a, it's basically um, very similar to a lot of cases in forensics where you come up against a, a new kind of software and you really don't know how it works. You know, have, maybe you can Google or something like that, but you, know, you don't know exactly how to parse these particular files. So what we want to do here is, um, so we have Edge. Do we have Edge on this machine? Yeah, we do have Edge here. So this is Microsoft Edge. I think that, yeah, that's the new one. So, you know, there's a new edge. It's no, oh no, that's the old edge. Okay. Oh, I don't want to download it. So um, I'll just use Chrome. Yeah, anyway, I think Chrome is probably fine. So wherever it says edge, we'll use Chrome. Um, so let's say we don't know how to use, how to parse the Chrome history, right? So the first thing that I'll do is I'm just going to do a little bit of investigation, right? poking around. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to see, I have this uh, Chrome browser running here, and I want to see a little bit about uh, where, you know, where does this Chrome browser write its files? Because I want to, it's probably where I'm going to look for. So the first thing I'm going to do is select star from uh, PS list, right? So I'm going to 
try and see, uh, investigate this browser on this machine. So let's see what kind of information it gives me. So I have the name, right? And this is just a normal process listing. Okay, great. So I'm only really interested in uh, where name matches Chrome. Chrome. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of, oops, from, oh, where? Name matches Chrome. So we've got a whole bunch of Chrome, uh, Chrome processes, right? And we don't know what exactly they do, right? But um, <clears throat> let's say we pick one, like this guy. So this process, I don't know, it's some process, but I don't know exactly what it's doing. So what I want to do is maybe I want to have a look at all of uh, the open files that it, it has open, because probably some of these files are going to be where this they store the cache, right? Um, so in order to, to check out what open files, uh, files are handles. So I'm just going to look at the handles. Uh, Okay, it takes a, uh, a process ID, okay? So for this example, I mean, we, we're gonna do the for each later, but I'm just gonna pick my process ID and let's limit it to, I don't know, 50 handles because there's quite a lot of handles. So let's look at the handles. So there's all kinds of handles. This is the handles uh, plugin and it tells you all the handles in this process and there's different types. So this, uh, if you just kind of browse uh, through them, you can see that there's like threads, there's keys. So this is all the registry keys it's got open, but then there's some files. Some of them are, are open, but right? these are actually pipes. So let's, um, let's, in this case, we're just looking at where type matches file, right? So let's just look at files and, um, Maybe we're going to look at all of them, right? So we have, all, this one doesn't have too many files, but it's a Chrome process, right? So that's cool. So what we want to do is take this guy and then for each of those Chrome processes, select star from for each, okay, row equals, so for each of those processes, we're gonna run, we're gonna look at the file. So we just, it's another example of for each. So for these pits, right? So for each of the Chrome processes, I'm gonna list all of the files that it's got open, right? So um, let's see what that gives me. So I'm looking at the first five, you know, Chrome processes. And, you know, and so I don't know what each process does, but I can tell you that it has some files open, right? And now this is kind of what we want for this exercise. So it just gives us an idea. We're like getting some visibility about this, this uh, Chrome thing. We don't know exactly what it does, but we can see that, you know, it's got uh, files open in users, mic, app data, Chrome, user data, default, and somewhere in there, right? So. So now we get more of an idea of where this Chrome, you know, thing works. So cool. So so uh, that gives us the directory where to look for. That's great. And now we we are not really sure whether the user download. What we want to find out is whether the user downloaded from these uh, this this browser. But we don't really know exactly how this browser is using uh, is in you know storing the the URLs. But probably it's going to store it in something that will look like a URL, right? So it's going to be like a database, but inside the database, there'll be URLs stored in the database somewhere. So let's write a URL that, that detects something that, you know, kind of looks a little bit like a, um, like a URL. Uh, so let's, let's uh, have a look at that, right? So if we detect, a, um, so this is going to be our rule. Right, and we're going to apply this rule. So let's create another VQL cell. Actually, let Yara rule equals. Now I'm going to use three quotes here and paste this 
thing here. Uh, so in the latest version, in the next version, this uh, syntax highlighting is going to be fixed a bit, but uh, right now it's, um, it's not highlighting correctly, but it still will work um, with this triple quotes. It's a raw string. Okay, so that's, so that's great. So that's one of the strings. And now we're going to look at, so we know, select full path from, we're doing a glob, right? We're gonna look for files that are in uh, uh, users, mic, app data, local Google Chrome user data defaults, right? So somewhere in there, this directory. So uh, we're gonna, let's edit that thing again. Yeah. And you know, C call, right? So again, we're gonna use our three quotes here. Uh, that's gonna be our row quotes. Okay, cool. Um, so let's just do a limit. So there's not too many just in the, in the first instance. Okay, so it's going to find, oh, and we wanna look recursively in there. So star, star, yeah. So it's giving us a whole bunch of files and directories. So, um, well, you know, it's probably not gonna, you can't store it in a directory. So let's just, uh, where not, not is there, right? So we can remove, uh, if you recall from before, uh, there was that is there field that told us whether it was a directory or not. So these should show us files. You can also, we can also see the size as well. Yeah, so th that shows us some, some size. So um, now inside of these files, I don't know which, right? But there's gonna be some URLs in this file. So what we wanna do is we wanna uh, look at each of those files and then do a Yara scan of those to try and come up with the different uh, hits, the different URLs. So, so let's do select star from, so for each of those row equals, for each of those things, right? Uh, we're gonna do a query, select star from Yara, Yara is a plugin and it takes a parameter, a whole bunch of parameters. So the first parameter is gonna be, so there's a files that tells us the file to take full path. So this path that it gives us here, that full path, that's what you should be opening. Great, what else does Yara take? So it takes a whole bunch of uh, different ones, but I, I mean, the most important thing is the rule, like where to start, you know, how many to hit. And uh, so we're gonna give it the rule. We're gonna use this Yara rule as the rule, right? And, and then it has the number. So the number is like how many hits inside each one, each file. And after one file, it stops, right? By default. So we're gonna give it, you know, lots. To, we don't want it to stop. We want it just to do all the URLs in, in the file, right? So, so that's gonna, that's gonna help us there. So what this is doing is, let's recap, it's gonna look at all the files in this directory. And then for each of those, it's gonna apply the Yara, uh, this Yara uh, rule on it. And this Yara rule is gonna hopefully match some of the URLs. Okay, so if we run it, um, then you can see immediately, let's, let's uh, just stop quickly so it doesn't take too long. Um, you can see that it's, it's created a lot, lot of hits and you can see here's the URL. So it's, it's making hits on URLs inside of these files, right? And over here, we have the file name that hits, right? And then uh, we have all kinds of information as well about it, like the modified time and stuff like this. But really all we care about here string, is the string. Now this is the data. The data is actually, uh, it's not really, uh, uh, hex encoded, it just looks that way because we are converting to JSON. It's really a binary string here. So we can actually convert it into a string. So from here, all we really want is 
string, which is this column here, dot um, data. So which is this one here. And uh, we just want to convert it to a string. Right. And that is the URL actually. Okay, and also we want the file name. File name. And uh, maybe also we want the offset, you know, string.offset. So let's let's put that in there. String dot offset. Right, and uh, let's have a look. Do that again. And stop. Yeah, let's let's see whether that gives us better. Yep. And uh, where are we? So so we've got all of the URLs. We've got the hits, and we've got the string offset in there. So if we have a question to say, like, did they um, did the user download this malicious code from somewhere? Then we can already answer that. We can essentially run, um, <clears throat> yeah. So some of these files uh, can't be scanned, so it, it just it just gives us warnings. But essentially, this is this is essentially a carver, right? So it goes through and carves all the files for URLs. Um, yeah, and and uh, we don't really the, the the idea here is that we don't really need to understand the data. We don't need to understand or parse any of these files. We just need to, uh, so it's kind of like, uh, we don't really have any context either, either, right? So you can see like, okay, someone opened this presentation here, but I don't even know whether, you know, why they opened it, you know, what does it even mean? You know, when, when they opened it, I don't have the timestamp. I don't know really any, anything about it, but for a triage, uh, this is brilliant because uh, usually you just need to know whether there was a hit at all, uh, and then you can, uh, you know, investigate in more detail. Uh, yeah, good question. Is it possible to get contextual data with Yara matches like recall volatility in addition to the match itself? So what Yara is is just a very simple uh match so the only context uh oh are you, so you're asking about context is in before or after the, the hit is that what you're saying yeah okay cool cool yeah i understand what you're saying okay let me just show you yes yeah, so basically um let me just if we do a limit here limit 50 uh, then it will stop quickly um yeah so it gives us so it's a little bit easier so uh over here, you see that the hex data, so the hex, this hex data is exactly the same of this data, right? Um, and, uh, and it's exactly matches the URL. You can, you can tell Yara to also include a bit of context around the hit. Uh, it's one of the options, right? So context is how many bytes to include around each hit. So for example, if I wanna get like 10 bytes on the left and 10 bytes on the right, uh, then you know, then it's going to give me a bit more context, right? So uh, it tells me what's so that's actually really important to in certain things, right? So yeah, I mean, in reality, I would actually also include context, but but it it doesn't really then match a proper URL. But that's okay because what you can do is you can you can do the context and then apply the RSIG again to the string to get the, you know, uh, without a context. So, so you can get both versions, context and no context, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like searching for IP and you hit it in the IS log files, you're going, oh my God, you know, that's, uh, that's that gives you context around where you're hitting it or whatever, right? So yeah, so you can include context around it um, if you wanted to. Um, yeah, but, yeah, if if you make a context zero, then it's you know it looks a bit you know more like a URL like this. Okay, cool. So uh, we did that. Yeah, cool. So uh, I just wanted to go through this uh, exercise. You know, it took uh, kind of a long time, but just to try and understand what um, the process of of doing this, and also because I love Yara, and it's really cool. 
it's it's actually a really cool technique that uh, you know a lot of people underutilize. They don't really appreciate it um, because if you if you think about it, um, you know you can you can do both. Um, if your rules are very loose, then you're going to get a lot of false positives with the error, right? And it's not that useful. Uh, but if your signature is really specific, then it makes a really great signal. So the, the thing about Yara is to try and think of how am I going to get my signature to be really specific. And, uh, and so when I run it against the, um, the whole fleet, uh, then the results that come back are really high value. So I can you know, go in and, um, and look at them in more detail. And um, uh, yeah, the other thing is that it is kind of expensive. So when you are actually scanning with Yara, you can actually also limit the how fast it's going to scan. So reduce CPU load on the endpoint. Uh, and you know we've got client-side throttling. So I'll just show you that real quick. Uh, I think we mentioned it uh, already. So when you schedule uh, anything on the endpoint, uh, oops, uh, if you select a Yara or any, anything really, it doesn't matter, but it's more, more useful with Yara. If I select the Yara scan and I go to specify resources, then I've got this ops per second. And, it, and that essentially in the Yara case, it means how many, so an op is just like an arbitrary operation kind of. And um, with Yara, an operation is defined as like, I think as scanning one megabyte uh, you know, per second. So if you go up per second and you lower that, then it will, you know, slow it down. It will scan slower, more slower. <clears throat> um, so you can do that. Okay, cool. Um, so cool, let's move on. The next topic is um, uploading files. So, you know, the, we already mentioned with Velociraptor, we can upload files and it's the VQL that causes that to happen. And uh, really, the, the, it's very easy to do, right? All you do to upload a file is you just use this upload VQL function. So it's just a function. And when it evaluates, the file gets uploaded. So in, in the VQL, it's just really easy to, um, to, to use. So just to give you the next exercise, uh, collect all the executable in the user's home directory. You know, you might want to say collect the executables in the user's home directory. So this is a very simple uh, example of, of a query. Now we can do it in the, um, uh, you know, in the, um, in this, let's just create another VQL cell all the way to the bottom. Sorry, I'll create it from here. Okay. And let's go back to that query that we had where we looked at all the executable in the user's download directory. So globes equals uh, users. Uh, and we're going to use all the users, right? Downloads. Uh, right, so that should give us all the users downloads, right? So there's a whole bunch of these users downloads. So we can see them with the full path, right? But but we actually, uh, in this exercise, we wanna actually upload them as well. So to upload something is very easy. It's like hashing, right? You just use the upload function and it takes a parameter file. So we just give it the full path. That's the file. and that's really it. You, you can also specify a name uh, and then the name is the file name that you should store on the server. Um, and um, so, which usually you don't need to specify because it's, it's really the file. It's going to just use the file name from, from here. When you run it in the notebook here, then it will say upload or not configured. And the reason why is because um, there's nothing to upload it to, right? Like we, we we're literally in the notebook, we can't upload it anywhere. So it doesn't make any sense to do that. So so it it basically you see it runs the query properly as as normal, but it doesn't upload it anywhere because it doesn't know what to do here. 
Uh, and there is, the reason is that the uploader does sort of the right thing depending on context. Uh, but let me show you how to, how to actually, um, so the idea is that you develop the, the, the VQL up until the point where you want to upload it, and then you create an artifact and then you collect it. So let's create a new artifact. And we're going to call it uh, windows.upload user executable, whatever. So this is just a name. And again, these are all defaults, which are fine. Um, you know, windows like that. And uh, we're just going to copy this guy over here. So it's a very simple query, but pretty much does the right thing. So now, just need to line that up. Now the question is, um, you know, maybe this is fine to be art coded, um, or maybe we want to add it as a parameter. So it makes more sense to add it as a parameter. So I would say, okay, generally you don't like the hard code stuff in in here. Um, so I would say, okay, um, uh, upload globe. That's what it is, right? Globe. And then I just copy this guy, put it here, and we're just going to call it upload globe. Okay, so it's going to basically go through. It's just a standard globe, nothing special about it. Um, and then we're just going to hit the full path and do the upload. We can give it a, a nicer column name, actually. That would be good. Um, yeah, so that's, we'll save it. Okay, and now we're going to collect it from our endpoints. Oops. So there it is. Okay, so that's the one we created, the user executables. Now we have a parameter that we can configure. So we can change the globe if we wanted to in the UI. Uh, otherwise, you know, we just go for it, right? And uh, and then you'll see that it basically just, it will just start to upload files, right? Um, there we go, see? So, but it's actually going to have, it's going to be quite massive, right? Uh, because I don't know what it's uploading, all kinds of stuff there, right? So there is a, uh, we might stop it, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. We can stop it, but you see it basically went through and uploaded it, and you can start to see the files coming up here. Yeah, the .NET installer or whatever, right? So it could be huge, right? So obviously you wouldn't want to do that, but for this example, it's just it's just an example, right? But yeah. Okay, cool. So uploading, um, uh, we have not a lot of time for NTFS. So <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about NTFS because you guys probably all know about NTFS. Um, so other than to say that, you know, the details of NTFS uh, analysis are, uh, you know, you, you, you can read a lot of books and stuff about it, but uh, what I wanted to show you in this uh, part of the, of the workshop is how Velociraptor can use the NTFS parsers to, uh, to get some very uh, low level kind of examples. So NTFS, uh, I just assume you guys know NTFS, right? Just as a quick quick uh, overview, uh, NTFS is the file system on, on Windows and there is a master file table, which is this big table in the, in the file system that tells you all about the different files in uh, in the NTFS. So I have a picture of it, um, of the master file table. I have a picture of it here. So it's just a big table, right? It goes over there. So a table means a file that has records in it. So this is a record, this is a record, this is a record. All the records are the same size. So because they're the same size, it means that I can index or just jump into a particular record straight away very quickly. So I don't need to, um, so, so each record has an ID, a rec MFT ID. And so I can just jump into each MFT ID. So each record represents a file on the disk. So, um, so that's, that's uh, MFT, it's a big table. 
uh, the, the actual contents of the file is not uh, stored in the table. It's just stored you know, on the disk, right? But the metadata about the files, so the timestamps and other things are in this uh, entry, MFT entries. Um, and uh, yeah, Velociraptor has MTFS support, which we can parse out. Um, so we've seen, uh, let's go back to this globe thing, actually. I've got it here. Let's get this out of the way. And uh, if I added the NTFS accessor, and uh, let's limit it to you know, I don't know, five. So it's it's still doing the same thing, uh, you know, as as uh, any other globe. But you can see that we've got this. Let me just show you the raw data. So we've seen this before. We talked about uh, the device being uh, the full path starting with a device name. But the other thing is that you've seen that the data, remember we said that the data column just contains key value pairs that are relevant for the uh, accessor. And when you use the NTFS accessor, it tells you the MFT ID of each column. So we can tell you know, um, which MFT ID it comes from. Uh, and then it tells you about the uh, short name, uh, long name and short name, these kind of things. Um, okay, and also there is a volume shadow copies. So uh, volume shadow copies are um, a way of creating an additional, uh, it's like a, a copy on write type uh, thing. It's really cool. Let me create one really quickly. So on Windows, if you're in a server environment, you can use this uh, VSS admin to create uh, the shadow copy. But in uh, Windows, I think this is an enterprise system, we have to use this WMIC thing. So let's do that. WMIC, shadow copy, all create volume equals. So that... That uses uh, WMI to create a new um, volume shadow. Uh, and so I can actually use VSS admin uh, list, oops, list shadow. Oh, VSS admin list shadow. Shadows. Okay, that's better. So this lists uh, all the shadow copies on the machine. So you can see something really interesting with the shadow copies is that there is the volume name is, is like this global root. And then there's a hard disk volume shadow copy one. Now with Velociraptor, it treats those. So this is actually a device name for the raw, raw uh, version of, of the shadow copy. So if you look at Velociraptor, uh, and if you even look at the VSS, uh, the, the VFS uh, entry, the VFS uh, view here. Uh, when I list the top level directory, then uh, I will see, uh, come on, is it doing it or not? If I list the uh, top level directory, VFS list directory, then it should should show me the two different um, uh, devices, right? So it should show me this is this the uh, VFS, um, uh, the VSS, sorry, uh, and this is the C drive. So these are the two different top level. Now, if we actually look at the properties of them then you will see that it's this one is a shadow copy for C drive. You know, that's the shadow copy. And this is the volume name and, and so on. Like there's different, um, sorry, this different uh, information about it, right? So that's the shadow copy. And uh, what it is, it's actually a, a device. So we can use the NTFS parser to just look inside of it, right? And it just looks like, it's just like a snapshot of the file system, you know, at that time when the shadow copy was taken. So what this means is that you can actually do uh, like a difference between that 
and uh, you know, and the C drive. So you can see which files have changed between the different uh, times. So Velstraptor allows you to do that. There's a whole bunch of artifacts that do these kind of uh, differences by themselves. Um, like for example, like you, you can find all the VSS copies of the event logs by just you know doing a star here, and so it will do. It will find a C drive and then the one in the V in the VSS. So this is like a simple way, but there are artifacts that that uh, do it properly that you don't you can you can uh, rely on. So particularly, um, if we just search for the VSS, VSS, then oh, sorry, VSS. Then you can see that you can give it a globe here, search files globe. So in, by default, you know, like it, it uses a security event uh, event log, and then it gives you all the versions of this of this log. So you know, if you want to collect that. Uh, collect, collect that one, but this actually works on any globe, right? So you can give it, it's like a, a super version of the globe uh, expression. So I can give it uh, maybe all the secure, maybe start on EVTX, for example, and it will do all the logs and give me all the versions of the logs, um, you know, from the VSS or from C drive. And, uh, and if the log hasn't changed, so it deduplicates it as well, right? So if the log hasn't changed, then it only sends one version, right? So I don't have to have multiple ones. It, it does take a little bit longer because it has to upload all the logs and upload all the VSS. So it's parsing both, uh, but it's, it's a good way to try and get uh, evidence that may have been deleted if it sort of happens to be in the, in the, VF, in the VSS. Uh, I'll just let that run for now. Um, just don't want to run out of time. <clears throat> the next, um, we have three different uh, levels of parsing of NTFS. The, the first level is just looking at the MFT, the master file table. And it uses this parse MFT plugin to scan the MFT uh, file, the dollar MFT file. So, you know, a lot of the time, what people do with forensic analysis is they copy the, um, they copy the, the MFT from the, um, oh, there's a question here. Do we need to worry about input checking from the user? Uh, input checking, you mean in the, in the uh, box, in the checkbox? Uh, because, so no, well, that's a, actually a very good, uh, yeah, that's a good question, right? Uh, you, you, you might have heard of uh, SQL injection and you might wonder, is it possible to do VQL injection? You know, like, yes, it is. And that's why when we uh, write our VQL, uh, it's a very good question. I, I do want to, to cover that. Um, oh, so many things to cover. So if you look at your artifact, so this is an artifact, right? And you can see that you, you have a parameter and the parameter uh, what actually happens here is the parameter is inserted into the environment. So then it depends what you're going to do with this parameter. If you're going to do things like string concatenation uh, or try and figure out like a command to run or something like this, then you can in fact uh, open yourself up to uh, you know, SQL injection, command line injection, all the usual things, you still, you still have that. But if you just pass that, uh, so in here, when we're doing the search file globe, uh, we just pass it straight into a globe expression, right? Uh, and so, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily, uh, we, we just pass it and, you know, you know the, um, there isn't really a, an opportunity for injection here. So yeah, always be aware that it's possible to have command injection. Uh, sometimes it's actually what you want. So for example, like, you know, we have this command called shell, right? And uh, this, is, this is actually the, um, the thing that's running, right? Uh, this particular one is the internal one that's running in the shell interface that I showed you before. And this artifact is actually totally designed for you to write 
arbitrary shell commands, right? Because that's kind of what it's for. So it is, see, this is an example. Of, if you didn't intend for that to happen, then you would be worried about injection, right? But that's kind of what you, you that is what you're supposed to do. This is what it's for, for. So because you don't want to allow any any user to um, because essentially you know that's arbitrary shell command, then we can actually specify a required permission. And you say that you have to have this exec VE permission, which only admins have um, to to be able to actually use this artifact at all, because we are already saying this artifact gives you you know by design arbitrary command execution. So yeah, so in that case, you know, injection, command line injection, you know, that's going to happen, right? Because that's what we want. But it's a very good question um, that, that you, you have to worry about when you're writing an artifact. Okay, so real quick, um, let's look at the MFT. So the easiest thing um, to look at, uh, let me just collect it first. So that's the easiest, the easiest thing. Um, that VSS thing is finished. I just wanted to show you real quick uh, what have we got? Oh, so it, it basically told us uh, all the different uh, di different files, but it didn't upload them. Oh, maybe I didn't, did I? Maybe I needed to click an upload button. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I did have, no? Oh, it's it just searches for it, but it doesn't upload it. I think there was another one that uploaded. Anyway, uh, let me just grab the MFT. So just search for the MFT and we have Windows NTFS MFT. This one is very simple. Uh, it just basically grabs the MFT. Um, so it, if you look at the artifact, it gets all the drives, all the drives that are NTFS, and then it uh, basically uses the, um, oh, where is it? The pause MFT, pause MFT plugin to grab all the MFT things. And then you can filter, you can filter them out, right? By the timestamps, you know, like this time or that time, these kind of things. Uh, the example of event deleted. Um, yep, yeah, let's see if I have uh, some time to do that. Let me just, um, uh, let me just uh, launch it. By default, it just grabs the entire MFT. It'll take a couple of minutes to, uh, to do that. Um, can we show the example of an event deleted? Um, yeah, how do we do that? Let's delete some events. <laughs> Event log. <clears throat> yeah, so if I go to the event log and uh, I don't know which one, like system, system event log. And if I wanted to clear the log, let's say, now I already have a VSS, right? So, so if I diff, if I grab the um, the event log from the VSS and then grab it from from the, if I clear the log, right, and then grab the event log from the the real log and then the clear log, you know, I'll be able to get that. I just need to wait for Windows to get itself moving. Yep, and then clear. So we clear the log, right? Uh, and then in here. What we can do, there is uh, event logs. Uh, which one is it? Uh, pause and returns event windows event logs. And then we've got the search VSS, right? So if I select that one, and just to make it a little bit easier, we'll just do system EBTX. And then if I click this search VSS one, uh, then it should find stuff, right? Because we've just cleared the logs, right? So it should find some things there as well, right? So uh, that MFT thing is still going going on. And this one, see, it found all the log logs. And then when you look at the results, oops, um, then you can see, does it tell us where the log came from? Yeah. Yeah, so you see, so this particular log uh, event came from, you can tell that it's come from the VSS, right? Because it's cleared. But, you know, so so that's what it does. This particular artifact, it compares the two uh, event logs, you know, one from the VSS and one from, so this is the question, 
can you show the example of events deleted that you can recover from the PSS? So anyway, while we were waiting for that MFT thing, we, we did that one. So yeah, that artifact does that PSS analysis. Um, okay, uh, let me just uh, go back here and take a look at that MFT. Um, it's gonna take a while, but I think results are already here, so we can just start looking at it. So this is what that artifact returns. It's just a big table of the MFT. So it really just looks at the first entry, second entry, two, three, four, five, and these are all just the MFT entries. And we, we get the MFT path, which is the full path. Uh, oh, this is the path to the actual MFT. We get the full path of the file, um, you know, inside of the uh, file system, obviously. And, uh, and then we get the file name, we get, and then we get all these timestamps. So it turns out that NTFS has lots and lots of different timestamps uh, in lots of different streams. Um, what did I want to say about the MFT? Yeah, so it's actually really useful uh, because essentially when you are using that MFT artifact, you're going to visit every single uh, MFT entry on the file system. So if you want to do something like uh, find, you know, whether this file system had a particular file anywhere, it does it, does it have an execute, this, tell me all the executables on this file system. Uh, then it's actually quite, it's much more efficient to do an MFT scan than it is to do, uh, to, you know, to, to do a globe, for example, because an MFT, MFT scan will look at the entire file system um, and it's, you know, it's much more efficient. Uh, where was I here? Does it pause for deleted files? So it just pauses the MFT. And uh, if the MFT entry says that it's not allocated, uh, then it's deleted, right? So you can see um, in use is uh, telling you whether it's allocated or not. So, you know, this is, uh, we, can, we can just jump over here somewhere. Oh. And we can maybe able to find some that are, you know, um, that are not allocated. Let me just show you uh, what we normally do with the, uh, with when we collect the MFT. So, uh, this one is a full MFT scan, right? Um, you can you can uh, post process, jump to the notebook, and you know if you wanted to know some uh, some files that are not allocated, where uh, not not in use, yeah. So the in use is the column; it's true or false. We want to get the ones that are false, and um, and we're just going to look at the first fifty, you know that are unallocated, right? So I'm not sure how long it's gonna to take to find them, but it will just pull some, some out. Um, now, what we can do, okay, let's go over here. Uh, what else did I wanna show? Yeah, so when you, uh, where am I? 56, I've lost my place. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay, cool. So if you wanted to look at uh, where all, we're parsing all the MFT where the file name matches uh, exe. So that looks at all the executables on the disk. Um, yeah, find all the executables on the drive that were created after Gen 20, 2020, right? So again, this one uh, basically did a full scan, right? But uh, oh, I can click that. This one copies the uh, the collection, so it copies it and allows me to configure the parameters. So what I can do is I can put a file regex, which is going to be dollar exe dot. You know that's a, a uh, exe file that that applies to the file name itself, and I'm going to say date after. Um, what did it say? I don't even remember. Jan 20, um, let's just let's just do like, I don't know, April 1st, I don't know, some, some date. Uh, and so when you do this, then it still does a full MFT scan, but it's only going to return the rows that match, so a lot less rows. So, um, so it, it should um, take a little bit less time, but more importantly, it's transferring less data from the endpoints uh, as well. So you can do a hunt 
and you're getting less rows coming back, right? So it's much more targeted. Uh, I don't know how long it's going. How long did this take? This one took um, 108, 91 seconds. So it's like uh, um, three minutes. So we'll let that one go. It should be a similar time, but it will return a lot less rows. Okay. Um, MFT entry, right? So an MFT entry can have multiple attributes and streams, right? And the previous example that we saw, it only shows high level information about the MFT entry. So uh, the MFT entry has, uh, it actually took a lot less time because it's much more targeted and there's less columns, less rows. So, um, so it's only sh showed us the stuff that's. Uh, um, let me just let me just uh, segue here because it's really important. Um, the traditional approach for doing uh, MFT uh, processing and uh, digital forensics is uh, let's just grab all the MFT files from all our endpoints, bring them all um, to the to the endpoint, and then run some tool on them to parse them. And then we're going to put some, uh, you know, put them in Excel or, or something, and and try and start to, you know, filter out those columns, uh, those those um, files that were created in the right times, and build timelines and things like that. But um, but so that's a traditional one. But that doesn't scale, right? Because if you have, you know, any number of uh, machines, uh, like say ten thousand endpoints. Uh, the MFT itself is going to be like three or 400 megs. So pulling the MFT itself back just doesn't scale. Even if you pause it on the endpoint and just say, just pause all the MFT on the endpoint and bring the results back. I mean, we're looking at about 300,000 uh, rows per endpoint. And this is only a very clean machine. It's just been built, right? So on a real machine, you're talking about way more than rows than that. And then all we're going to do is take all of this data and then start to filter it, uh, you know, and this just does not scale. So it's much, much better to do all the filtering straight up on the endpoint. So when you are collecting the MFT, then uh, restricting it, remember that here we restricted it by file names and timestamps. And we can, we can do that and it's much faster and it's much more efficient to do that. So you can think of it as the source of truth for the MFT is the endpoint. And so it's much better to do this filtering on the endpoint and just bring back those results that are relevant for your search than to bring back more data and then and then try and scale it up and, and uh, process it. Um, okay, so this is just a bit of a, of a segue there. Now, uh, another cool thing about it is that, uh, you know, in, in this kind of, when you collect all of these uh, MFTs, uh, what I what I always like to do uh, is do a bit of a timeline, and you can do a timeline in the notebook here. Uh, so a timeline is basically what you are trying to do is show all the file names that are created, uh, sorted by time. Uh, so you can you can actually see this as a post processing step. So for example, here what we would do is we want to uh, show like uh, let's say the full path, but what we want to do is put the time first. So you, you can pick any of the times. There's, as you can, as uh, we mentioned before, there are many times, right? There's the created time or the last modified time. Now this, uh, this created time, OX10, is coming from the standard information stream. And the created time, OX30, is coming from the file name stream, right? So there's, there's different ones. So we've got all the 16 timestamps. There's a lot of them. But we can just pick one. Uh, so, for example, maybe we can pick the created OX30. And then what I usually like to do is put that first. So it's just a little bit easier to see. And then I've got my full path and, you know, maybe my size. I'll put the uh, file size in here. Size. So that's this column. And I think the rest of them are not super relevant for a timeline. So if I do this, then it basically just, you know, gives me, you know, the whole, uh, just these columns. But to make it a timeline, I want to so order by, right? Create it. So I want to order it by that. That gives me a timeline, right? So it's basically going to run through and order uh, everything, you know, in in uh, in order of time. So that builds me a timeline. Now this is 
much easier to do a timeline that's already um, that's already narrowed down, right? So you see, we went through and we said, only give me the um, the files that have that are after this particular time. So I've got a lot less a lot less files to sort. So this sorting is you know a little bit expensive, right? But um, what we can do is if you look at the uh, full MFT scan here, it's still the same. You'll still do the same thing, but um, you know, but let me just copy these, this information from this hunt. Yeah, so this is a time, a time uh, so it's still gonna take a timeline. It's still gonna take a long, uh, it's still, it's gonna take a long time. It'll still do it. Uh, but it will have all the events in it and it will have 288,000 events just sorted, you know, properly. And it will take a lot longer to do, um, you know, so, but, and, and then if you end up with, you know, essentially a timeline <clears throat> that you're just going to skip the first 90% of it, then what's the point, right? <clears throat> okay. I'll, I'll leave that going uh, while I'm talking about the next, the next thing. Uh, okay. We're a little bit over time, but, Talking about the timestamps, there are different timestamps in uh, in the different um, you know streams. We've got the standard information, which is that OX10 one. We've got the file name, which is the OX30 one, and we also have timestamps in the I30 stream. So there's lots of timestamps in NTFS. Um, <clears throat> there's time stomping. I, I, I'm not going to talk too much about time stomping. There's an exercise here you can play around with it. Um, it's, you know, I don't know if it's that useful. Uh, I know that people do the time stomping <clears throat> and it's possible to, um, to detect it, but there's just so much legitimate uh, software that changes times on the system that, you know, it's, it's not really a smoking gun. If you see time stomp uh, files, then it's not, doesn't, unless, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? Because you know it could have been unzipped, like when you unzip something, it time stomps it. So you, you know we're going to play around it with the time stomping here, uh, and write some artifacts to detect it. But in practice, it's not. I don't think that's that useful. Uh, the timeline analysis we've done that. We sorted it and we built a timeline. <clears throat> Timelines are useful because you can tell you know when prefetch files and link files and so on are. Yeah. See, so this one is like a full timeline. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, in here, what you can do is we've built a timeline as before, and then you can create another cell from this cell. So you can see that this cell has, you know, the timeline. So it's sorted and it's built. But now what we want to do is we want to actually look at filter that. So when we create a cell from this cell, what it does is it, if you, you can see that it, it's reading the results from the previous uh, cell, right? So it's just reading what's in there, literally. So it makes it a lot easier um, to kind of post-process the output in another stage uh, of, of this. So for instance, in here, I can, I can say, you know, well, full path matches, like let's say, you know, the prefetch files, then I can see when was, you know, when, when the prefetch files were created or, oh, I actually, I only are restricted by executables. So, so I don't have prefetch files here. Maybe I should do it on the full, on the full thing. So create cell from this cell. Yeah, where full path matches dot pf. Right, so <clears throat> So that's going to show me all the prefetch files, and it's essentially pre-processing. Uh, uh, it's post-processing the output of the previous, you know, processed uh, table. So, it, yeah, so it's much faster. So we can narrow it down, you know, and keep and keep working. Yeah. So this gives us a little bit more uh, context. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, we have a whole bunch of skip slides. So I've actually skipped slides here that, you know, you guys can read if you want, uh, but, you know, we don't have time to cover. <laughs> um, okay, I think we are a little bit over time. 
Um, do you guys mind to go another five minutes? Because this is probably <laughs> the coolest thing. Otherwise, we can do that next week. I don't mind. Um, we can we can go another five minutes. Okay, cool. So the USN Journal. Uh, the USN Journal is like one of the coolest things that I think uh, in in uh, you know in Windows. And and um, what happens here? What the U the USN is uh, is essentially it's not the same as the actual journal that's used, you know, in the journaling file system that's NTFS. Um, it, it, what it does is it actually writes records of uh, whenever a file has changed. Uh, and the reason that uh, that it, it's created is so that backup programs can essentially understand which files got changed so they can go and back them up, right? So, so there is a reason for, for it that's not forensics, but it turns out that it's a, such an excellent forensic source that, uh, that you know, it's, it's really cool. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a file that's in the NTFS you know, file system. So it's a dollar file. So you can't really see it in the file file system. And uh, you, can, you can actually navigate to it uh, you know, from uh, the VFS. So if you have a look at the top level of a C drive in the NTFS, uh, using the NTFS access, accessor, then we can see um, then we can see those kind of, you know, uh, NTFS files, which are the dollar files. You can't see them in the file accessor. And, uh, and then you will see um, this user journal column $j. So the column $j actually means that it's an alternate data stream. It's an ADS. Uh, but Velociraptor doesn't really care about ADS because it just creates a name that, that uses these columns. So it just looks like a separate file. Now, if you have a look at the file size, you see that it's it's absolutely massive, right? So it's like uh, in this case, it's you know 430 megs because it's a pretty new VM. I mean, it's just a new VM. But you on a server, you know, this could be gigabytes or even terabytes big. Uh, and this is the USN journal. If I try and collect it uh, from the client, then uh, you'll see that it it looks like it's 400 megs. You know, and it's, it could be quite large, but in actual fact, you see it stopped after, you know, getting 30 megs. So what is going on here? So it's telling us that it's sparse. And what does that mean? It means that it's a sparse file that it, it, the file, it doesn't contain all the data. Let's have a look at the artifact that we've just uh, collected. Remember that the GUI just collects the VFS uh, artifact and, and look at the uploads files tab. And over here, you can see that uh, this is the file size. File size is 400 megs, uh, but the upload size is only 41 megabytes, right? So it's only uploaded 41 megabytes. And the reason why is because this file is sparse. So let's have a look at this, this file. So the file size is quite large because every new records are being written on the end of this file. They're just getting appended to the end, right? Uh, but then Windows reclaims the front of the file by making, uh, making it sparse. So this is where it's kind of like consuming this after, every now and again. It just kind of like delete, it doesn't delete the file, but it deletes those blocks in the file by just extending that sparse uh, part of the file. So it's like, so the end part is actually real, but the beginning is, doesn't exist, right? It's just a big hole in the file. So this is important to understand. Uh, understand. So, so usually there's about 30 or 40 megs here in, in practice, right? Um, and that's really cool. Let's have a look at what actually is in the journal. And the best way I can show you is just to collect the journal, right? So I'm gonna go USN and, and just grab the USN so it just pauses it, right? It just uses the pause USN function uh, plugin. And then I can just, I can also filter it, but uh, let's just grab the whole thing. It doesn't take uh, too long and there's not that much data in it. Uh, there's about 40 megs, right? So we're gonna have, I don't know, a few hundred thousand uh, rows and then we'll be able to see what, uh, we've got some rows so we can look at it already. And this is the type of information that you'll find in it. So the first thing is the USN uh, number. So that's the, uh, the ID of each record. 
then you have a timestamp of when the record was written. Then you have the file name and uh, and there's actually an MFT entry uh, in there and Velociraptor will take that MFT entry and try and resolve it to an actual file. Be aware that if the file is deleted, uh, if that file was deleted, then this resolution may not work or may just give you just junk, right? So it's not foolproof, but it's, it's pretty good, right? So just be aware this full path here is not always correct, right? Uh, but basically what happens is it's recording, uh, you know, when, uh, what changes were made to this file. So in this case, you know, this file was uh, extended, it was created at this time and, and so on. And here was deleted. And if we look further down, we can see some deletions. You see that file was deleted at that time. So you can see both when the file was created and when the file was deleted. And this is really cool because it remember that uh, it actually doesn't really, we don't, that this journal doesn't, um, doesn't rely on us looking at unallocated MFT entry. It's just a journal. It's literally something that's written down that says, you know, this file was created here and was deleted here. It was created here, was deleted here. And this data is invaluable because it's really, really great. You know, when you're doing a forensic uh, and you're like, uh, what, what happened on this system at this time? If you happen to be there quickly enough to grab that USN log, then you know exactly what happened on that file system in this time, right? Because you know, even if a file was deleted, you still know that it was there and it was created when it was created, when it was deleted. And this is really awesome. Also, the other cool thing about it is that you can tell exactly when the file was modified. So uh, let me show you another really cool example of the USN. We're, we're gonna talk about this in the next, uh, the next one, the next uh, module about the prefetch. But for prefetch files, uh, for the prefetch files, we actually, uh, uh, what happens is when you run a binary, it, up, it updates the prefetch file, right? Uh, so, but prefetch files only can only store the last eight times that they've been modified, right? So if a program runs a lot, then it's only gonna remember the last eight times in the prefetch file itself, right? But if we look at the USN journal, then we will see every time that prefetch file was being modified, we will see that it was modified. Like this particular guy here, it was modified, you know, here and, and so on, right? So every time it was being uh, modified, I mean, so actually each change may, may take several operations, uh, but it actually, as it goes as far back as that USN journal. So, so we actually can tell uh, sometimes a lot more than those eight uh, timestamps. So, so it's very cool. Uh, USN journal is very cool. Now, the most critical thing about USN is that you need to grab it as soon as possible because it gets cleaned out. So it depends on uh, on sometimes you know you can't get to the you can't get to the response part for a while after the event happened, and you know as soon as you get there capture the, the US engine or at least parse it out the, uh, the US engine like I just did so that you know you you capture that uh, evidence because it's only about 30 or 40 megs and it gets overwritten. Sometimes if the system is not, is not very active, then it will last you know a week or two. but sometimes you know if the system is active, very active, then it only lasts a day. you know so you know you've got a so it's actually pretty cool. All right, so that's the USN journal. I think that is the coolest thing. Um, what do we have here? Oh, yeah, so we can we can actually filter it and and uh, and find, you know, things like link files when the, the link files uh, appear and and build up user activity based on based on that. Okay, so uh, post process with. Okay, so so that's the USN journal. All right, so. Um, we we kind of rushed through this uh, this this module. There's a lot of material in here, uh, but this module covered the the basic uh, forensic capabilities in Velociraptor, and you can already see that we can do so much with uh, with these basic 
building blocks uh, uh, of globbing, of searching, uh, and of NTFS analysis or, and its various, um, you know, various artifacts from NTFS. So, uh, and but the um, the best uh, use of VQL is to put together those building blocks in a new uh, novel way and be able to then use those things to develop, you know, some uh, pretty cool um, uh, detections and think out of the box, just like we applied the Yara signature to just come up with URLs, we'll think out of the box and try and try and come up with new new kinds of uh, ideas. Okay, cool. So um, so that's that's that. Uh, volume shadows, we, we also call, cover volume shadows. Next time, what we're going to do for the second part of the forensic analysis is we're going to look at more sophisticated and more specific uh, types of, uh, of pauses that are in Velociraptor for different kinds of evidence. Um, and I mean, I think a lot of them are uh, pretty easy to use. Um, so we're going to essentially skip a lot of, so there's a lot of skip slides here we can look at. Uh, but we're going to really look at event logs and, uh, and and things like that in the next one. So it'll be more more uh, more of you know more kinds of forensic um, capability. Cool. All right. And as always, if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know. Send uh, you know send me an email or jump on Discord. Uh, have a play. Um, and thanks for thanks for attending. Stop the recording.